Hi everyone, my name is Laura Scholes mortier and I am a 2010 Eastern Michigan University graduate. And I am here with my daughter Matilda, who just turned three. And we're here tonight to present to you Goodnight EMU, which is a short series where we are highlighting alumni authors right here from Eastern Michigan University and their children's stories. We hope that you stick with us tonight and enjoy these upcoming four stories from our own graduates. Thanks and go green. Hello, my name is Jordan J. Scavone. I am an alumnus of Eastern Michigan University with my master's in children's literature in 2015. Today I'll be reading my second children's book, The Mud Princess. There was once a princess, a princess who was loved by all others. Princes constantly attempted to gift her wonderful things. Other princesses would do anything to be her best friend. Even the very flowers would grow at her command. This princess was not Georgia. No, Georgia was the exact opposite of this princess. She was unkempt, wild, loud, and of course, muddy. Stay away from her, the other princesses said to each other. She's not a real princess like us. She is just a mud princess. And so, that's what they called her, the mud princess. But to Georgia, that's all she wanted to be. Though happy with her mud pies and leaf wreaths, there was some small part of our mud princess that wanted more. Many nights she would look up at the castle that loomed in the distance, the castle of Princess Priscilla the Adored. When a letter arrived at her mud pot bearing the royal seal, she tore it open. Dear princess, <laughs> You are invited to the sixth birthday of the adored princess. The party will begin at the foot of Dragon Mountain tonight at sunset from Princess Priscilla. At a quarter to sunset, dozens of princesses from the land gathered at the foot of the mountain. Their beautiful ball gowns of mauve, gold, silver, and scarlet dotted the fields. Within their arms, marvelous and grand gifts sat. Georgia arrived, and in her right hand she clutched a small, mud-covered package. Who invited the mud princess? asked a princess dressed in mauve. Not I, answered one, nor I, spoke the second. Look at her dress, the mud totally clashes with the purple. And there's sticks and leaves in her hair. Gross! All of the princesses laughed loudly. Georgia lowered her head. A single tear fell clearing the mud from her cheek. Georgia fled from Dragon Mountain and a loud BOOM echoed through the skies. Screams from the princesses carried through the trees to where Georgia sat on a stump in the forest. Georgia turned in the direction of the mountain and with a leaf from her hair, she wiped the tears from her cheek. You fell for my trick, foolish princesses. Now I, the princess-eating dragon, will enjoy a smorgasbord of princesses for my dinner. He coiled his long tail in a perfect circle around the princesses, trapping them. Then rearing back, he prepared to strike. Stop! The, vo the word echoed from the forest, a voice that had never been heard before. Georgia sprang from the trees. She stepped up onto a large boulder and pulled a stick from the tangles of her hair. I am the mud princess, and you will release my princess friends and leave this land forever. Oh, I will, will I? The dragon bared his terrible teeth. Quick as a flash, he opened his jaws and clamped them down with a snap. The princesses screamed, just like that, and covered their eyes. Silence filled Dragon Mountain. The mauve-dressed princess uncovered her eyes. She elbowed the other princesses, who also uncovered their eyes. Looking up at the top of the boulder, they stared with amazement. Georgia had stopped the dragon's bite with the stick she carried. The princess eating dragon's mouth was stuck open, his tiny arms too short to retrieve the stick. The dragon flapped his large wings, and in an instant he flew over the mountain, never to return. The princesses cheered and gathered around Georgia. I'm so happy that someone invited the mud princess, exclaimed the princess in the mauve dress. As am I, shouted one. Me too, said the other. Look at her dress. I want mud on mine too. That day, 
the princesses learned a great deal. The mud pot she lived in would no longer define Georgia. She became a princess who was loved by all others. Princes constantly attempted to gift her wonderful things. Other princesses would do anything to be her best friend. The very flowers would grow just to be stuck in her hair. This princess was Georgia, the mud princess. Yay, thank you so much, Jordan. Can you tell us a little bit about um, why you wrote this book? What's the, what's the background story? So uh, besides the fact that I had a mud princess in my classroom, so this is Georgia, the actual mud princess. She's in my author photo with me. I actually have her sister now, so maybe there'll be a sequel. Um, I really wanted to do fantasy as a follow-up to my first book, which is superhero-based. Um, but I also wanted to look at anti-bullying in a different way. 90% of your anti-bullying kids' books deal with a school setting, but kids get bullied everywhere. So I wanted to bring it to light in a different setting. Um, and I really wanted to do something with fantasy, so. Well, we loved it. And then, you like, it, Tilly? You like the book? Good. And then can you um, share with us for all the maybe future eagles out there watching tonight, why is it important to read starting at a young age? Um, so what's really nice is that it allows your toddlers um, ah! to be entertained. Um, so you did very good during that story time. I'm very proud of you. Thank you. Um, but it generates hundreds upon thousands, uh, potentially millions of new words that they may not have heard or had without them. So then there's a difference between, you know, listening to music and hearing those words and, and watching TV or cartoons and getting those words. Um, it's about the story that's behind the story. So you're not only getting all of these words and all these new words and how a story flows, uh, but you get to look at the pictures and you get to follow the story with just the images too. So kids his age can look at the images and enjoy it. Kids her age can look at the images and hear the words and enjoy it. And then older kids and adults can read it and enjoy it and follow the story. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight on Good Night EMU. And check out The Mud Princess by Jordan Scavone. Hi, my name is Bren Barnes, and I am EMU alum, Woo! and um, I'm from the class of 2009, and this is my book, Books Do Not Have Wings. It has pages and pictures, a cover, it's true, even words and a writer and readers like you. It can do anything that you want it to do. It's more than just a book, because books do not have wings. Books have, don't have engines or trampoline springs, and this for certain has all of those things. This is a sculpture, some fine work of art, a puzzle assembled for taking apart. It plumps up your thinker and fills up your heart, and where you end up is not where you start. Surely, it's more than a book. It can be a port of sorts, the dip of a ship on a trip, of course a passage by pirates for faraway forts. This here is a submarine, a never look back pretended machine to explore the depths of the vast marine with urchins, seaweed, and schools of sardines. Come closer, dear reader, and see the unseen, this thing that's not a book. If you look, you will see it's a cunning old shrew with a bubbling brew of lizard stew tapping the toe of her crooked shoe, planning potions for ogres and princesses too. Suppose it's the gleam of a dream instead, nestled inside a dragon's head, who sleeps in the sky with clouds for a bed and stuffs stars with wishes that fly overhead. Though it comes to an end, do not be misled. This is not a book. It's a flock of fairies chatting with trees and painting the colors on lilies and leaves, dusting the forest enchanted with glee, singing together in twos and in threes. It's older than old and newer than new. It can't be what it is without someone like you. I'll tell you again, it's the truest of true. It's certainly more than a book. 
If it's not what it's not, then what could it be? Spectacles, perhaps, that might help you see? A tiddlywink, a rabbit hole, a cobble stink, a witch's mole, a watchamaroo, an old moldy scroll, a doodly do, a long bearded troll, a long afternoon in a cubby hole, a flying balloon or a porridge bowl, three little oinks, a pirate's right hook, an alien zoinks, even gobbledygook. A book is a book when all by itself, when it's closed and flat, alone on the shelf. If and only if you don't care to look, then and only then will it just be a book. The end. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Bryn, for joining us tonight. Thanks Can you tell us a little bit about the book and what was your inspiration behind it, why you wrote it? Sure. The way that I write is I usually just hear a line. I hear a voice or something that just kind of comes and catches my ear. And it was actually the very beginning of this book because books do not have wings. I kept hearing this line over and over again, and I kept wondering, what is this about? And I said, well, if it's not a book, then what is it? And I just started writing and I just started doing free writes. And um, I got this, this voice and this rhythm and the rhyme and it just all came together. I was gonna say, I think that's what attracts kids to the book is the rhythm and the rhyme to it. Yeah, love it. And then tell us why all the little eagles out there that are watching us tonight, why is it important to start reading at a young age? Because reading is the thing that gives you wings. Reading is the thing that, that saved me from <laughs> being an only child <laughs> and being bored um, from just the minutia. I mean, reading is, is, what, is what opened my whole mind up to the rest of the world. Um, when I started hearing other voices, when I started picking up Shakespeare before I really knew what he was saying, I fell in love with the rhythm of the words and the language and I thought, I don't know what this is, but I can just feel that it's something special. Um, so reading just, it, it's like water for the soul, it just, it, it lets you bloom, you know, and that's why I love reading, that's why I love writing and um, I, what made me want to start is just that feeling. When I read the first thing that I loved, I just wanted to give other people that feeling. Well, you did tonight for sure. <laughs> Thank you for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> How are you doing? My name is Ryan Griffin. I am a graduate of Eastern Michigan University. I graduated in 2002 in African American Studies and Sociology, and I'm currently a grad student in the School of Sociology. Uh, today I'm going to be reading uh, my book. It's called Roman Gets a Haircut. It's part of a series called Roaming with Roman. A is for Andy. Andy's Barbershop has been in a neighborhood for over 40 years. B is for Black. It is one of the many Black-owned businesses on the block. C is for chairs. There are six big chairs inside of Mr. Andy's Barbershop. D is for donuts. Mr. Andy had a fresh donuts for the customers. I could smell them when I walked in the door. E is for eight. Roman's dad was eight years old when he first got his hair cut from Mr. Andy. F is for family. Mr. Andy's barbershop is known as a family barbershop. Fathers and sons always get their hair cut there together. G is for good. Good morning, little fella, said Mr. Andy to Roman. H is for hello. Hello, Mr. Andy. This is my son, Roman. Today, he's getting his first haircut. I is for itchy. Dad, will I be itchy after I get my hair cut? Asked Roman. No, son. Mr. Andy will cover you with a cool looking cape. J is for jump. When it was Roman's turn, like a big boy, he took a big jump into the chair. K is for king. How do you want your hair cut today, Roman? Asked Mr. Andy. Like a king, shouted Roman. L is for little. Okay, said Mr. Andy. I'll cut it a little on the short, on the sides, and leave a little on the top so it will look like a crown. M is for move. Be a big boy and don't move, said Roman's father as he sat by the door. N is for nervous. Roman was a little nervous when Mr. Andy began to cut his hair. O is for opposite. There was a kid sitting opposite of Roman who was already getting his hair cut. P is for people. 
Roman looked around and saw there was a lot of people waiting to get their hair cut too. Q is for quiet. Although Roman was quiet, he noticed that everyone else was talking, laughing, and playing checkers. R is for Roman. How are you doing, Roman? asked his father. S is for super. Super, shouted Roman. He's doing just great, said Mr. Andy, just like you did when you were just a kid. T is for terrific. Terrific, said Roman's father. U is for under, but underneath the cape, Roman's hands were kind of sweaty. After all, this was his first haircut. V is for vanilla. These vanilla donuts are delicious, said Xavier. He was a kid eating while he was waiting to get his hair cut. W is for whoa. Whoa, I look like a king, said Roman after Mr. Andy handed him the mirror. X is for Xavier. You're up next, Xavier, said Mike. He's the barber on the opposite side of Mr. Andy. Y is for you. This money is all for you, said Roman as he reached into his pocket and paid Mr. Andy. My father said that it's nice to give you a tip. Z is for Zoom. Roman zoomed to his father and jumped into his arms saying, I did it, I did it. I got a haircut all by myself. They both smiled and gave a big hug. Roman Yay, thank you for coming tonight. Can you tell all of us and tell the viewers tonight what your inspiration was for this book, why you wrote it, what's it about? My inspiration for writing the book was my grandson. I have a grandson named Roman. He's my one and only grandson. Uh, but I would say about 2015, I started a program called Read to Your Barber. And it was a program that kind of took off across not only the United States, but it caught fire around the world. Okay. What I did with them at a barbershop, I'd read about some barbers from Harlem, Tampa, and Iowa who had kids reading to them while they were getting their hair cut. So what I did, I decided to add an incentive on it and add $2. So it caught NPR and it just kind of went crazy. And the whole purpose was to make sure the kids were comprehending. So the way that the kids earned the money is after they read the book to either me or their parents to prove that they read the book and had a little bit of comprehension, they would tell us what it was about and I would give them the $2. So after doing that, and I've still been doing it, passing out books to different barbershops, I figured if I'm going to be giving kids books to read, why wouldn't I write my own? My wife is an author, she's wrote a ton of books, and so I'm just trying to enter her realm. But wow. reading comprehension has always been important to me. And I've been privileged enough to be invited into a lot of local schools to speak with teachers and principals to talk about the impact that reading has had on kids. It's given them confidence, and those kids who were afraid to raise their hand or read when it was their turn, now they're in class raising their hand, reading more than they were supposed to. So it does more than just put a book in their hand, but it's giving these kids confidence. Awesome. Wow, such, you're such an inspiration. And okay. if you don't mind looking in the camera, telling our future eagles out there why they should be reading at a young age. It is so important to read at a young age because you have to, you have to comprehend what's going on around you. It's important to read at a young age because we all want to be something when we get older, whether it's an astronaut, a doctor, an athlete, or what have you, especially a teacher. Besides, reading gives you a ton of confidence. So read, read, read. And also, one of the reasons why I like to read, and I like for kids to read, is you use your own imagination as opposed to watching movies. When you read a book, what you're doing, you are creating the visual. You are you know, having yourself think about what it looks like or what a character may look like as opposed to someone else giving it to you. And it's just, you're just being more imaginative and creative when you read. Well, thank you, Ryan. We're really excited for you to be here with us tonight. And um, yeah, we really appreciate you. I appreciate you. <laughs> Go Eagles. <laughs> Hi, my name is Shanda Trent. I graduated from Eastern Michigan University way back in 1983, where I studied to be an elementary teacher. And I did that for many, many years. And in that time, I started writing books and I'm now a picture book author. Today, I'm gonna to read you my most recent story called The Planet We Live On. This is the planet we live on. This is the air we all need for life that encircles the planet we live on. This is the rain that a big cloud delivers that fills up the oceans, the lakes, and the rivers Rain falls through the air we all need for life, showering the planet we live on. This is the sun, so fiery and great. Its heat helps water evaporate, 
creating the rain that a big cloud delivers to fill up the oceans, the lakes and the rivers. The sun warms the air we all need for life and lights up the planet we live on. This is the soil on mountain and plain. It is warmed by the sun and kept moist by the rain. A welcoming home for seeds and plants. Soil covers the planet we live on. These are the plants in a green parade, offering all of us food, homes, and shade. Plants grow in the soil on mountain and plain as they soak up the sun and the sprinkling rain. Plants purify and recycle the air as they grow on the planet we live on. These are the herbivores, fast and slow. They nibble on grain and leaves as they go. Plant eaters keep fields from growing too tall as they graze on the planet we live on. These are the carnivores ready to leap and dine on the herbivores weak or asleep or nibbling plants that grow on the plain or basking in sunshine or lapping up rain. Meat eaters keep the animal herds from crowding the planet we live on. Plants and animals someday will die and here on the soil their bodies will lie. Scavengers come to bite and tear then decomposers take their share. They clean the land up while they feast. Food for plants is then released, enriching the soil that covers the ground on Earth, the planet we live on. People need them all to survive. With care and respect, our planet will thrive. Long live Earth, the planet we live on. This is the planet we live on. Thank you. Now, can you tell us a little bit about the inspiration behind your book? I worked at the Kalamazoo Nature Center one summer as a nature day camp leader, and I wanted to find a way to explain the web of life, um, the food chain in a simplified way, to young children. And as I looked for books, they were all very teachy, very didactic. And I was at the library having story time with kids one day and they were reading the house that Jack built and a light bulb went on and I sat down and wrote this. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing it with us tonight. And if you don't mind looking out to our little Eagle viewers tonight um, and telling them why it's important for them to start reading at a young age. Oh, Eagle, Eagles, there, first of all, there are so many awesome books. How could you not want to read? but books build your brain power and they're fun. Keep reading every day and enjoy it with your family. Thank you so much for coming out with us tonight. You're welcome, thanks for having me. On behalf of the Eastern Michigan University Alumni Office, we'd like to thank you for tuning in to our second Good Night EMU. We'd like to wish all of our EMU families a happy 100th homecoming. Good night. <laughs>